All right. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to Policy at DEF CON. Uh, my name is Will Loomis, uh, and I'm a goon here. Uh, this talk is going to be uh, Cyber Policy Adrift, Charting a Path Forward for International Maritime Cybersecurity. Um, and we'll have a great panel of four people here. I'll introduce them all in a second. Um, but before I do so, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, first of all, this talk was going to be hosted on the record. Um, cell phones is a courtesy to our speaker and audience. We ask that you check to make sure your cell phones are set to silent uh, at this time. Um, if the speakers allow questions at the end, if we have time, please use the standing mic over there so that everyone can hear you. Make sure to point the mic uh, towards your face so that everyone can actually hear you. Uh, as a reminder, the DEF CON photo policy prohibits taking pictures without the explicit permission of everyone in the frame. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Uh, with that, uh, let's get started. I'm going to welcome our four speakers here. Um, first, uh, our moderator, Nina Collars, or Kitty Hegemon here, um, associate professor at the Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute at the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, and then our three panelists, uh, we have uh, Josh Reiter, uh, deputy PCA at the Department of the Navy. Um, we have Blake Benson, uh, industrial control system and cybersecurity practice lead at ABS. And we have Cliff Neve, uh, director for MAD Maritime at MAD Security. Welcome all, and thanks for joining us today. Over to Nina. So in true DEF CON fashion, uh, I'm going to look briefly at my colleagues and did you have prepared remarks or are we just going to, okay good, I'm going to ask questions. Just, we prepared for this. All right, so I'll start just by introducing myself briefly um, and then I'll let my colleagues do so as well. But I want to talk a little bit about what I thought the, what the, what the logic was about building a panel that looked like this or just thought about this and, and the thing that, that I wanted to kind of dig underneath, thanks. Um, is that despite the fact that the oceans are a shared space, both legally and in terms of the resources we use, the entities that are allowed to govern or required to operate upon it actually have very different perspectives on what it is they're getting to get up to, what the problem actually is, and how we solve it. And so I wanted to make sure that we had a rep who could speak to us about what the Navy sees when they see the maritime industry and cybersecurity what the private sector sees when they think about this question, what the Coast Guard thinks. So I wanted to make sure we got that on the table. So if that doesn't come out by the end of the talk, by the end of our talking to each other, please press us a little bit on that. Uh, I am recently out of the office of the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, which is inside the Pentagon, and I have just returned back to the US Naval War College where we'll work on things like defense critical infrastructure, but also thinking about how we go from everyday operations, you know, sort of cargo shipping to uh, le leisure cruises, all the way up to high-end conflict, where the Navy is thinking about sort of warheads on foreheads and that kind of question, right? So that's all fair game here. Um, so if I'm gonna step back for a second and let my colleagues introduce themselves. Sure. Uh, my name is Cliff Neve. Um, I'm with uh, Mad Security. I'm a retired uh, Coast Guard officer. Uh, my last uh, duty s assignment was as deputy commander at Coast Guard Cyber Command, and I was kind of like there when it happened, as far as the Coast Guard um, standing up uh, cybersecurity and starting to implement cybersecurity into the Maritime uh, Transportation Security Act type of elements, and uh, that that's my background. Yeah, Blake Benson. Um, first things first, I mean, I'm a washed up cyber operator um, <laughs> by trade. I was doing Title 10 OCO and DCO at the Air Force and was specializing in kind of non-traditional vulnerability assessments of uh, combat weapon systems, which included airframes at the time. And um, started an OT cyber risk practice, and I guess it's been about four years ago. Um, with the American Bureau of Shipping, and so kind of was grandfathered into the uh, maritime industry, but it turns out um, ships are just kind of really slow planes uh, in a lot of ways. <laughs> so <laughs> it translated pretty well, and, um, and now we, we support various. We support the Coast Guard, we support Navy, uh, non-combatant ships. We've got a tremendous amount of, of um, like OT specific, industrial control system specific risk assessment work that we've done on uh, floating platforms out there, so. Thank you. Josh? Hi, I'm Josh Ryder. I'm the uh, Deputy Principal Cyber Advisor uh, on the Secretary of the Navy staff. 
Uh, I'm a former merchant marine officer, spent about five and a half years at sea. I was the IT manager for the Port of Austin for three years, so I know the, the waterfront and the shipboard side. Uh, and then I spent uh, way too long at the Office of Naval Intelligence, about 17 years, looking mostly at civil maritime issues. Um, and now I also work at the, the Pentagon, uh, again, as the Deputy Principal Cyber Advisor. Excellent. All right, so thank all three of you in advance. And I'm at, I apologize, I'm still sort of on shift as a goon. And then when I, when I leave today, I'll, I'll come off shift, so I'm still wearing my goon wear. Um, but I'm sure you'll forgive me. So. Let's start with just a top line question. Um, and so as you start to answer, whoever answers first gets to be the original one. What I'm gonna ask each of you to do is not say the same thing that anybody else has said already. And so I'm gonna start here, which is why should we care about the fact that we are still building policy? Why do we care about this for the maritime domain, if you were speaking DOD. So first one to answer, why should we care? And then we'll go from there. Just in time delivery. It's one of our greatest strengths and it's one of our greatest vulnerabilities. Uh, you've all undoubtedly been affected by strikes in the port of LA Long Beach, uh, prices going up, goods not available. And those are all just routine non-attack disruptions within the maritime industry. Now imagine something in the maritime industry on the order of a colonial pipeline where things are shut down deliberately, uh, where we lack resilience to get them back online quickly and container ships pile up outside of ports, can't offload, goods are not delivered, food doesn't get where it needs to be, goods don't get where it needs to be, and uh, the economic might of the United States is at risk. Why should we care? Sure. Well, you may have heard the term, you can't regulate, you can't regulate to security, but you can regulate to compliance. And one of the most interesting things about maritime is, especially when you look at the port environment, and ships are one thing, and, and we'll talk quite a bit about the policies and, and various kind of governing bodies that regulate ships. And really, they don't regulate at all. Um, they provide recommendations in a lot of cases, like IMO. Um, for example, it's not a legal requirement, but it becomes a pseudo requirement because you can't get insured um, if without that without that policy in place. And so that's a little bit different than like a, a federal regulator that says you have to do this. They make recommendations and then um, people adopt it. But in the in the port infrastructure space, the amount of stakeholders that are at any given port is so disparate. I mean, there is a you could have a, a an oil and gas refinery there, you could have a food and bev, uh, like chemical additives, uh, critical infrastructure there. And what applies to them is very different from a regulatory perspective. And that's where the Coast Guard comes into play. That's where DHS uh, chemical facility anti-terrorism standards come into play. And so um, we need to have more, I guess, kind of consolidated policy, but uh, consistent policy in how we approach this. And with the amount of federal stakeholders that are providing um, regulatory guidance in this space. We need to be aligned in what it is that, that we're telling stakeholders to do because they share a common environment. And that's the really unique part about Maritime. So public and private partnerships is kind of an interesting dance in that um, the United States, you know, our government is responsible for making sure that our critical infrastructure is secure. And typically it's private government, you know, private elements that are that are doing that. And so one of the, the big things from the Coast Guard perspective was when 9-11 happened, the Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002 was established. And that basically defined that um, certain critical infrastructure ports and facilities, offshore uh, rigs in some cases, uh, had to be uh, secure for the U.S. interest. And so the Coast Guard worked with public, you know, with the private sector to try to make sure that those physical security controls were met. And words matter, and we'll talk about that in policy, I'm sure, a lot. And um, the word cyber was not in the Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002, which caused me an endless amount of problems as an active duty Coast Guard officer trying to get cybersecurity uh, taken, taken more seriously um, uh, across the board. But um, so in 2020, on my birthday, ironically, um, the Coast Guard did publish a NAVIC that said, yes, 
cybersecurity is included in the Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002. That was only 21 years later, or only 18 years later for those counting. Um, but as a result, you know, policies are important and words do matter. And uh, one of the things that, that struck me as I was kind of preparing for this is that, you know, when you're working with policy, things take a long time. And policies take seemingly forever to get through. And perfection is the enemy of good enough, but you have to be good enough. And so we have to make sure from a policy perspective that we're moving forward uh, in a way that's going to be helpful to the private sector and help preserve our way of life and the way things go from a critical infrastructure perspective. But we also have to make sure that the policies that we develop are uh, holistic, are achievable, and, uh, and are good enough and are gonna, gonna stand the test of time. All right. So I have a question. So, so we're talking. We're talking in somewhat in the abstract, right? So we're talking about some some fuzzy idea of governance and some fuzzy idea of who's responsible and meeting standards and compliance, and that's great. Um, but I'm curious for each one of you, what is the what is it that keep what scenario keeps you up at night? What what when you go to bed, you're like, oh man, I really hope. This particular alignment, of, he's already. This <laughs> particular alignment that doesn't go down, right? Like, what is it? What is it that keeps you up? And, and, and you know, speak from your from your in, from your positional perspective, but also just kind of what keeps you up at night. What what scares you about this space that's not not well regulated? We have not done the hard work um, from the industry side or the federal side to decompose the functions and systems that support the most critical pieces of our infrastructure countrywide. Ports are a huge emphasis of that. 90, was it 90% of consumer goods go through the shipping industry? So, um, you know, the Coast Guard has done great modeling on the secondary, if you want to talk like risk as a, as a framework. Um, you know, they've done a tremendous amount of work on determining what the secondary and tertiary economic impacts of a cyber incident might be at any given port. Um, because that's similar to the same anti-terrorism models that they've been building since 2005, um, which is a really, I think, distinct thing we, we should hone in on. Um, that Those models, although were, they were built for anti-terrorism, still capture consequence pretty well in the port environment. And so, you know, you might say, well, we know, Blake, like, or, you know, anybody at this panel, you, you just said there's models that are built that show us what our biggest consequence is, the scenario that keeps us up at night. But the issue is there's no context for the functions that, that support those ports. And so um, supply chain on um, cranes that were uh, developed and shipped over and are now in Newport and some other places that um, had intentional back doors on them, uh, cranes that have uh, open DDE uh, vulnerabilities because the control system on the gantry cranes <laughs> are built by uh, basically buttons tied to ex open Excel, which is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> there's things like that. And so my worst case scenario is we didn't do the, what keeps me up at night is um, as ports continual, continually kind of become more integrated and more digitized, uh, we haven't isolated the functions that really make them tick. Like we haven't figured out what's really important in the in the port environment from a digital perspective to isolate in the military, we called it cyber key terrain. But we haven't defined the cyber key terrain in these port environments to a, to a point where um, our government stakeholders or even industry stakeholders understand where they fit in the system. And so there are scenarios, I'm sure that they exist. And um, you know, we've done great research on maybe, maybe we're college researches that everybody does research on it, but I'm sure there's a scenario where something so benign, like a, like a terminal operating system, for example, um, or when we move to port electrification, for example, a battery storage site, um, is gonna have a vulnerability that shuts a port down for a week uh, that no one captured anywhere. It wasn't in a risk model anywhere. <laughs> and so <laughs> defining what those functions are and kind of what's critical in a port environment is the first step to figuring that out and we just haven't there's not been a, a whole lot of joint work done on that subject for various reasons. I'll go last. Yeah. Whoever. 
Uh, what keeps me up at night and, and what concerns me the most is, I think, a lack of leadership and a lack of leadership understanding of, of cybersecurity risk. We and are on the record. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. So, so, no, no. And I'm not saying lack of leadership <laughs> yeah, from Cliff from any from, yeah, from any one thing, but no, no. From from what I've seen, so I've, I've been to lots of lots and lots of ports, um, and we we've worked with a lot of organizations. And so, what we see is when I say lack of leadership. It's the fact that at the CEO level, at the C level, nobody, nobody uh, integrates cyber risk in their overall business plans. I teach a class at the University of New Haven at the graduate level called cyber risk, cyber risk management. And the very first question on the very first quiz of my semester is true or false, cybersecurity risk should be separate from all other risks because it's so specialized. False, and it's a 100 point quiz and that's the only question on that quiz because because so frequently you go to these places and you see ports with you know physical security is just they've got tons of police cars you know one east coast port has you know all these police cars and a gate somebody escorted us to the to the facility they had a badge thing they had everything else and then the cio says yeah i can't get money for a sock i can't get money to, to monitor our network and, and it's like, this, what is wrong here? From like, like a leadership perspective, what's, what's going on? And Gary Kessler just at, at, the, at the last meeting, you know, he, he brought up a really interesting point. He said, the answer to solving the cybersecurity problem is to take the computer scientists out of it. And, and because frequently, um, they're not able to articulate the risk. And it's, it's a business and a, um, a mission area that the C-level personnel abdicate almost entirely throughout the board to their IT guy or gal. And the IT guy or gal doesn't always understand the mission risk, isn't able to articulate it, and if the C-level folks aren't paying attention to it, it's not gonna get the attention it deserves. And um, you know, even governmental organizations, very frequently, the, the component leads are like, well, talk to my CIO, talk to my, you know, no, this is a, this is a mission area just like any other risk. And so I think that it's, it's, there, there's a problem with visibility at the leadership level, and, 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 and maybe that will change as the digital natives ascend to these positions and they understand what an IP address is because when they grew up they actually had a computer as opposed to a lot of those component commanders don't have, have you know, were introduced to that later in life. So I'm hopeful that, the, that, that some of that's gonna change. All right, so we're going to go to Josh now and see if he wants to lose his job. Go ahead. I am less than three years from retirement. So. <laughs> go on. Go on. But, uh, but I'm going to actually amplify uh, two of your points. Um, the first is when we talk about policy, right? So this is, a, a, this is not a strategy forum. This is a policy forum. But policy is the bridge between strategy and execution. And if for no other reason, then I would like to keep my job. I'm not going to highlight a lack of leadership. I'm going to highlight a lack of coherent strategy, right? So in order to get to execution, you have to have a policy that determines what that execution is going to look like. And you have to know why you're doing what you're doing and, what you're, and, and how. And we're lacking really coherent strategy. There was a Maritime Cybersecurity Act under the, the previous administration. It was like 10 pages. You know, it, it, you know. So, so it's not that there is no strategy. It's just clearly not getting us enough where we need to be. And the other part that, um, that you touched on, and I'm not even sure you, you realize you touched on it, is the liveware. Right? We talk about hardware. We talk about software. We talk about critical infrastructure. What we don't spend a lot of time talking about, although we are now on the DOD side and the, and the National Cyber Director, uh, is, is the people. And um, the fact that there are technical people, your, your CIOs and your CISOs in the ports, is great because a lot of cybersecurity jobs are just completely vacant. So it's not even a matter of having people who understand, it's a matter of having people at all. And I'm concerned, you know, what keeps me up at night is that we're not creating the workforce of the future, right? We're still, we're still generating the workforce of the past for the jobs of the future. 
feel like Tyson, Tyson Metters is in the audience. I think he's, he's spoken about this a few times. Did you want to go ahead and... and well, I, I wanted to clarify that when I said lack of leadership, I didn't mean... Of, <laughs> of, 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 any, of, of any, I mean lack of leadership, yeah, right. lack of leadership in organizations in general, lack of, yeah, lack of, you know, lack of the CEO being responsible, so just wanted to clarify there. So, I, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, uh, I'm going to exercise the, the moderator's prerogative and, and monologue a little bit as well, because I watch this space all the time, and my job, by the way, is not to sort of think about specific policies at a federal level kind of research we do at the War College is we look at, you know, sort of how do you, how do you put a bunch of, bunch of folks onto a, a tin ship that's loaded with computers and then send them into the line of fire and like, you know, hope it all works out. Uh, and so the thing that, the thing that's been hard for me to wrap my head around, and I think that, I think that everything everyone said gets at it, the thing, this leadership and being able to articulate the problem is huge. Um, so if, if you haven't been paying attention, the United States um, has been in a period of, in theory, right, not actual um, active maritime combat for hmm, 70 years or so. And so, uh, so active maritime combat is a certain kind of skill, and so we haven't been doing it. And in the meantime, we went into a period of peace, the end of the Cold War, and we privatized everything. Uh, everything, right? So all the way down to how, how the Navy gets its stuff with very few exceptions, important exceptions, but very few exceptions, the Navy is reliant upon the private sector to deliver its stuff and it's by the sea. So can you imagine what that might look like if we decide that, okay, there's gonna be a, there's gonna be a great power war, we're worried about it, what, ha what happens, right? So we have made it cheap. We have made shipping monstrously cheap. And then we have no money for cybersecurity because it's monstrously cheap. And then I need to be reliant upon that system to be available in a high-end war. That's right, it's terrifying, right? Trying to and trying to wrap my mind around how do I even get back to something that I can control so that I can resupply, maintain, right? Again, I don't want to, not super excited about it. I don't want there to be a high-end war, but if there's gonna, I need there to be stuff. And so this is what keeps me up at night. Ports, who's operating the ships, how many ships we have, all of that. It's terrifying to me. But anyway, moderator's prerogative. Oh, I got a little dark there. Anybody else in it? <laughs> <laughs> nah. We good? Yeah. All right. So what are the challenges? What is, what is the primary challenge? So it says lack of leadership, but in real terms. Somebody, you know, somebody really needs to X. Someone has got to X. To quote a Chappelleism, uh, <laughs> this is recorded, but I'm going to punch down on my own people a little bit, including myself here. Um, traditional cybersecurity experts don't know how to communicate risk at all. I'm going to say that again. Traditional cybersecurity experts. Enterprise cybersecurity experts, doesn't matter what environment they come from, um, don't know how to communicate risk. And what I mean by that is what the problems that we've just discussed are a safety problem, like capital S, safety, right? And they fund those things. Uh, they will upgrade a refinery, they will upgrade a food and ad, like a, a sugar processing or boiler operation. Um, for sugar refinement or, or what, they'll upgrade a ship, no problem. Yeah. We upgrade ships all the time because the safety environmental management system on board or the safety management system says, oh, you're, you've got an issue here, and Wartzilla is quick to, <laughs> quick to give a quote back to the Navy, right? Or, or what have you. Um, we have not figured out as an industry, um, and it, it, I begin again, this is kind of an industrial control systems and OT focused thing, but it's like the nexus between um, physical process safety and just safety in general and how these systems that are digitally enabled help provide and support those functions to make the mission happen has not, like we don't know how to communicate that. Um, and there's not models for it, like bow tie models are really great for it, but we don't really use those in the US very much, which is strange to me, but <laughs> everywhere else when you go to the EU, like they communicate 
cyber risk in, in the form of a bow tie model all the time, but it's like we're just not, we haven't figured it out yet. And until we figure that out, um, the budget challenges that we've just talked about won't be solved because um, it's not, we can't translate cyber risk into operational risk yet. I mean, we can in some situations, but it's few and, few and far between. So that's a huge, huge challenge in my mind. So some of the self-improvement gurus will say that a good way to reframe things when you say, I don't have enough time to do something, is to say instead, that's not a priority for me, right? So when you say, like, I, you know, I don't have time to eat right, I don't have time to exercise, I don't have time to be healthy, instead say, it's not a priority to me to be health healthy. So I would say that from an industry perspective, we have a similar paradigm. Every time someone says, I don't have enough money for cybersecurity, in fact, what they're saying is cybersecurity is not a priority. And once we face that, once we take a good hard look at that, um, things will hopefully improve. And then the second half of that, going back to the people, is the, you know, the elephant in the room that OT is not IT. And that you can't send somebody to, you know, Microsoft training uh, for your industrial control systems, you know, unless it happens to be, you know, a Microsoft yeah. product. Um, and when you hire a CIO, you're generally hiring an IT person who looks at things with keyboards and screens, and that circuit board that controls a pressure relief valve on a gas main is really not in their, their wheelhouse. And we have to change that. If you look online for, you know, uh, vendor training for OT, there's like three orders of magnitude more stuff for, you know, your standard d desktop computer than there is for an industrial control system. And as much as I might be upset if my home computer crashed, I'd be a lot more upset if the power company crashed and I didn't have power to anything in my house. So I think that uh, that is an that is an industry. Um, both, both public sector and private sector, uh, we need to increase capacity and training for the OT side. Um, one of the challenges is definitely resources, um, and I think that one of the one of the ways that that the government has succeeded uh, recently between the Coast Guard and CISA is I, I see a lot of value add to the to the private sector, and. Um, you know, I know CISA does, offers free scans, offers free, um, you know, the Coast Guard has cyber protection teams that go out and do um, uh, free uh, assessments to critical ports and waterways. And I think that, that one of the big challenges is getting people to do cybersecurity the right way. And we see examples every day of people doing cybersecurity dumb, right? And, you know, example is some of these port security grant program things that come along. And in the, in the uh, Atlanta Council, I actually did a nice paper talking about how the Coast Guard could, be, could and should be inserted into that process. Um, you know, I've heard of port grants being approved for ports going out and buying a SIM. It's like, okay, great, so you bought a SIM. Who's going to operate the SIM? Okay, you bought Tanium. Really? What are you going to do? Okay, you have two people on your IT staff? Yeah, we're going to learn Tanium and we're going to figure it out. And then we're going to learn Splunk and we're going to deploy it. That's not a smart use of resources. So how can we work together to share resources, to share knowledge, to, to, to figure out how to do joint SOCs, you know, security operations? They're expensive. I own one. I own a security operations center in Huntsville. They're expensive. They're hard to set up. And even if you do it full time, it's a challenge. A port just doesn't have the resources or shouldn't have the resources to necessarily, most of them, unless they're the giant ones, to stand up all those resources on their own. I think one of the challenges is, is figuring out how to break down those barriers between governmental organizations and between private and public and using those funds instead of just saying, yep, here's $40,000 for this, here's $40,000 for this, here's $120,000 for this, saying, hey, here's a million dollars and we're going to service everybody. And so I think that getting people to break down those fiefdoms, and again, that's a leadership problem. It's not a technical problem. It's a leadership problem of people giving up their control over their fiefdoms. Um, and that is a 
ex an extraordinarily difficult challenge to face. If you've never been slow rolled by some, somebody on your IT staff, then you know, then you've never known. But if you think of that at, at the component level, it's even it's even more difficult. But I think that that that's one of the biggest challenges is using the right resources in the right way and breaking down those barriers. I want to be respectful. Oh, do you want to add anything? I want to be respectful of that people's time because I want to give you an opportunity to ask questions at any level that you want to ask. And so I just wanted to do a little bit more of prodding, and just sort of so say something nice. Uh, what is working? What is actually working, or what has promise that, that you think th this is working? Two years ago, <clears throat> we did a pretty comprehensive. Or actually, it's been almost three years ago now. We did a pretty con comprehensive. Um, study for one of the DHS centers of excellence, the Stevens Institute, on uh, the maritime industry as a whole. And we went back and reassessed like some change. We wanted to see owner operator, we, we commonly refer to like ports as a whole as owner operators. And it's like, okay, if you go to the port of Savannah, I mean, we surveyed them in 2018. Here's the results that they had based on C2M2, which is a maturity model for cybersecurity. We were like, you know, stack up against this, and, and it's pretty lightweight. And so we had those results, and we went back. And one of the things they couldn't answer back then was, who do you call when you have a cyber incident? Oh. Like, who do you call? <laughs> and they would say, oh, uh, InfraGuard. And it's like, OK, that's an option. Yeah, call the FBI. That one works. Um, or they would say, well, I'm supposed to call CISA, but I actually call Provider X, whoever their security provider is, who hopefully knows where they're supposed to report up to. In some cases, they would say, um, I'm going to call DOE, like for oil and gas, because of, uh, of Caesar, right? Um, and so CISA has done a great job. Uh, CERCIA, the new uh, Infrastructure Reporting Act that's, that's in, I think, still in notice for proposed rulemaking status, right? Uh, I think. Don't, don't hold me on that, but um, is re, kind of reestablishing themselves as the critical, critical focal point for all cyber reporting um, for incidents. And so that's huge because it helps streamline the process because oftentimes what happens in an incident is um, when you have multiple federal stakeholders involved, they all end up in a like Spider-Man exercise of pointing at each other, like here's how we're gonna transfer the risk. Um, and so it's like, if you cut the systems back on and it's still broken, it's your fault and you have to fix it, or it's your fault and you have to fix it. And so, um, yeah, I think CISA has done a really good job um, trying to centralize the reporting effort, and we've seen that in policy and in uh, you know, legislation as a response to some of the executive orders that have come out in the national security memorandums and things like that. So pat on the back for CISA. So um, I, I think one of the biggest things I saw out of the Coast Guard is that they've um, uh, resourced maritime transportation um, security specialists, cyber, at each of the 36, I think it is now, sectors, and uh, each district and each area. And so there are cybersecurity specialists now in, in each of those areas. And each of those sectors has an area maritime security committee. and. Um, I'm on the cyber subworking group at the uh, St. Petersburg one in Florida, and there is a very, very strong Coast Guard and CISA presence. Very strong, very respected. They bring a lot to the table. Industry is responding. All the ports come to the meetings. They're always informative. And I think that in many cases, you know, you have the high level policy, but then you have that organic you know, local, because you're always going to have the good old boys, the, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of really positives out of the, the, the sectors where they have a strong area maritime security committee with CISA and Coast Guard leadership and presence being involved, doing exercises. When you do those exercises, you start to figure out in a hurry who you're supposed to call, who's responsible for what. And so I think that, um, where, where the Coast Guard and CISA have done particularly well is by investing in those uh, positions at those sectors to, to actually embed and work with uh, industry in those areas. So on the public sector side, I'm actually really encouraged and downright proud of the, the latest uh, workforce documents that have come out uh, where we're establishing real work roles and training and qualification standards and it's not just like the IT person, 
you know, where people actually have to professionalize into what they're doing, and I'm hoping that will lead to a, uh, a greater lash up with that IT versus OT problem. Uh, on the public sector side, uh, I'm encouraged by the greater emphasis on HBOM and SBOM, and uh, the, the, the default result of that will be to put a, a greater emphasis on uh, components made by adversaries not getting into our critical infrastructure, or at least being aware of them, you know. Um, I look today and I'm, I, you know, I think that, uh, I think anybody who's working on critical infrastructure should have to watch the pilot episode of the Battlestar Galactica reboot. <laughs> like, did you learn nothing? You know, um, you should be able to run these things disconnected if you have to, um, because Cylons. So, that, those are the things that, that I'm encouraged by. That took a turn. Um, all right, so <laughs> that's, that's great. So I wanted to give the audience an opportunity to step forward um, and ask any questions, whether down in the weeds or um, higher up. And so I'm just going to sort of stand by and I'll, uh, we do have microphones or you can just yell. Go ahead. Hey, uh, my name is Don Moss. I'm a uh, former uh, Air Force, now Space Force Defensive Cyber O, so shout Space out. Space Force. Yeah. Um, in my experience, uh, some of our organizational leaders don't see uh, cybersecurity, they see it more as a checkbox, you know, just a tick, and not, and they don't really prioritize the robustness or the performance of their cybersecurity posture. So do you think, or in your experience, do you share the same sentiment? Or, and then, uh, is there ways around the policy, or can we rewrite the policy to where that they care about the performance of their cybersecurity, or cyber posture? I'll take first crack at that. So, uh, only speaking for the Department of the Navy, um, we've, we've, very declaratively started a shift from a culture of compliance to a culture of readiness. Having a three-year ATO that, that was not accurate the day it was signed, because it, you know, each individual piece of paper was a snapshot in time, um, is not protecting our stuff. And saying, okay, now I've got an ATO, bags down, feet up, I'll wait three years before I do it again, that's not working for anybody. So. Uh, there's a greater emphasis on, on true risk management, um, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to blow smoke here and tell you, yeah, we got this solved, man. We're, you know, we're all over it. Um, but we've, we've kind of done the Babe Ruth, you know, we're pointing at where we're going to hit the ball, and, and we've acknowledged that that culture of compliance is not serving us and needs to change. Performance-based standards is all the rage right now. <laughs> I mean, if you if you look at CISA uh, cyber performance goals, right, the CPGs that just came out, uh, there's more iterations coming for the sector-specific goals, which are a subset of the cyber performance goals. Um, they're all performance-based. TSA security directive for pipeline, first time it went out. TSA administrator was at a talk earlier this morning. He was like, it was terrible. We did a 180, and the second one was performance-based. And so there's two federal organizations that are um, really hot and heavy on the um, performance-based standards now. And so I think to your point, um, yes, performance-based standards as a policy uh, will help you get to security better than it will to compliance. Um, and you know, if I had my druthers, I would like to burn RMF to the ground. But the reality is, we can't do that. Um, it's the nature of the beast in a lot of situations, and so, you know, adapt and overcome. I agree. All right, good. Yeah, so we, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, what happens when the next colonial pipeline happens on a port, right? I mean, so that, that sort of leads me to think, like, I, I guess to solicit your insight into whether or not a, a policy or set of policies uh, that outline um, the sort of requisite um, conditions for a vulnerability found within vulnerability research programs to be disclosed to the vendor mm. rather than kept for the next mm. stuck snap, right? Mm. Um, it, it, it occurs to me that uh, transparency there might be helpful to the greater community, um, and it feels as though it makes me a little nervous to say, oh, well, let's just trust you all um, to sort of decide when something should be patched and when something should be, um, you know, weaponized for next split. I'm here from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> got nothing. Vulnerability disclosure. Where, where are you guys on this one? Well, I mean, 
you want the Fed perspective first? Or no, 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 I'm not in a position to articulate. <laughs> okay. Josh, no comment? All okay. you, buddy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was in that boat again. Like, I used to be the dude that was doing that. Um, feds call it capability development uh, in a lot of situations, and so I was in that position, and um, I think we need to do a better job of establishing who you can go to. Um, it came up again this morning, like I just talked about TSA administrator's call. Someone asked the same question in that talk, and Good. he was like, call the FBI. And I was like, I don't know any, I wouldn't call the FBI. <laughs> like, the FBI doesn't know what to do with cyber charges. Like, I'm going to catch a charge if I call the FBI and disclose a vulnerability. They don't know what I'm doing or who I work for, you know, like that's uh, kind of out of scope, right? Um, and uh, who do, you know, so it's like, I think we need to be, there are people within the federal community who are responsible for liaising those things. I think we need to have more resources available for people to understand who they need to contact in that space. I don't think that we do that very well at all, um, coming from being in your shoes, right? Um, I had a program that I communicated through and there were people designated to help me with that specific slice I was working on, right? Um, in reporting that and getting it out and disclosing it. Um, it's one of the big reasons that big providers in the, in the OT space like Dragos don't do attribution because they want to be able to put everything out, right? They want to anonymize things, pseudomize things, right? So um, yeah, that, that's a really, good, a really good one that needs more work, so Thank you. yeah. I want to just to, to follow up on that. You don't have to stand there the whole time, but, I, but the, uh, there's walking around on the floor here is a goon named Silas Cutler who has long made an argument for what we call a single front door for vulnerability reporting, whether that's the Department of Defense or if that's the federal government. I think, frankly, the federal government's the right answer. There is no single front door for U.S. vulnerability disclosure for, for, for threats to the United States in particular. There is a patchwork of networks of friend DAs and back office phone calls. And so one shop will receive a report and they'll call somebody they know from another office because it's not my slice. And so there is this conversation that has slowed over time, but probably needs to be picked up again. So um, yeah, Silas Cutler is the person I talked to about that. But yeah, it's, thanks for, for bringing that up. You all have identified that there's a general lack of concern at the executive level for most of the organizations you've supported. Being a policy-based talk and knowing that um, industry doesn't tend to do something out of pure goodwill, is there any stick to or carrot approach that is taken, particularly in the you know, ABS view of the world, like. You're gonna get, you're gonna get fired now too, all right. <laughs> hey, we're yep. uh, not gonna get a vessel certification if you don't do cyber right, or. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll step in front of that one. It's gonna boil down to insurance carriers, right? Cause so in, insurance carriers tend to worry about exposure to data breach, not in general liability of people and personnel. Well, insurance carriers, I, I submit, are concerned with anything that they could end up paying out on. Sure. Regardless so is there, is there a is. tie to the and insurance I, I go back to my colleague's point of that as, as a professional cadre, cybersecurity professionals are not good at expressing risk. Mm -hmm. so, so coming from the merchant marine industry, one of the questions on the Coast Guard exam is, you know, in, in like two and a half inch white letters on a red handle in the lifeboat, what does it actually say on the handle? Sure. Now it could say, danger, lever releases the hooks. Danger, lever does any number of things. What it actually says is danger, lever drops boat, right? Now mechanically, it's releasing the things that are holding the boat in. And it, apparently it used to say, you know, hey, if you pull this handle, these hooks will let go. And people go, okay. Why do I care? Because the boat will fall. And you are in the boat if you're holding on to the handle because there's no <laughs> other way to move the handle unless you're in the boat. And you're only supposed to do that when you're in the water. I submit we, as a, a cybersecurity cadre, need to be better at explaining lever drops boat as opposed to cybersecurity risk, mer, 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 ransomware, mer, mer, mer. Sure. And, you know, and people go, yeah, okay, whatever. And, and we, need to be, we need to be better, as my colleague said, as, uh, of articulating risk. 
So I'll give this my very individual perspective on affiliated. Um, I would say that uh, we also need to figure out incentives in addition to the, 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 the stick. And, you know, we've been talking about DFARS and CMMC uh, for those who are familiar with DOD contracting and DOD rules. So that, that, that came out in 2013 that, that, that folks are supposed to be doing that. And here we are 10 years later. I mean, we, would, we put a man on the moon in that time in the 60s, but we haven't gotten DFARS and CMMC across the line. So you could fix a lot of those problems tomorrow by just saying, okay, look, any contract that has controlled unclassified information in it, 20% or 15% of the weighted evaluation for winning the contractor criteria will be cybersecurity. And what is your cybersecurity stance and what is your cybersecurity posture? That will then incentivize people to actually go out and do cybersecurity instead of going, all right, what box do I need to check? They would, they would then be incentivized to invest because right now the probability of win is unimpacted by cybersecurity. It's a cost, it's a cost center that you get no investment out of towards your probability of winning a contract or your bottom line. Um, so I would, I would submit that figuring out ways to incent um, in addition to policies is a way to do it. And I think that we haven't been able to crack that nut as effectively as, we, as we'd like to. I think it's fair. Um, we've got, we have five minutes left. And so unless you're burning, we want to give this gentleman yeah, no, no, no. person That's what I was yeah. going to say. So five, let's go. Yeah, good afternoon. I had a real quick question about uh, vessel-specific uh, cyber policy, because you were talking about earlier about how there's only a pseudo policy for vessels and technically mm -hmm. because of SMS and all those things, there's no actual policy. And you're talking about, too, like how we can't let the fact that there's no perfect solution for that not get to good enough. So I just wanted to ask, in terms of cyber policy for vessels, in terms of kind of like preventing like cyber incidents, like what does good enough for that actually look like? We, like? yeah, there's, and it actually was what I would answer uh, the gentleman's question before you as well with, which is uh, the International Association of Classification Societies, which is a really <laughs> long thing. Um, <laughs> Just developed to these unified requirements. ABS, my parent company, American Bureau of Shipping, is a classification society. So is DNV. So is Lloyd's Register, German Lloyd's, um, amongst others. And so uh, the International so Association of Class puts rules in that we have to follow as class societies. That's what allows us to maintain our nonprofit status, status not for profit status, as a class society. Uh, they just did cyber this year. Uh, for new ships, well, they've been working on it since 2018, but new ships. Um, that have a request for uh, essentially the, the date for the ship to be built, we call it an RFC, um, after January 1, 2024, have to abide with uh, roughly 70% more controls. And some of them are really technical. They want you to do monitoring on board ships to, for hardening of material as an, as an option. Um, not that you have to do monitoring, but it's the easiest path of resistance if you want to comply with it in some cases. And so. Um, how do we do that? What do we work on? Well, uh, the standards-based performance for IACS is based in ISA IEC 62443, not NIST. And that's a big deal. Like from a practitioner's perspective, I can find you a bunch of people that can do NIST 853. Uh, I can find you a lot less people that can do an ISA IEC 62443 attestation. <laughs> So that's a big, that's a big leap that I'm really excited for. Um, you know, it's going to be part of class, so it's a requirement. You can't, you can't get a vessel certified after this year without it. So if it's if it started construction on that date, two minutes. <laughs> Will Loomis. Hey, all. Thank you for joining today. One question on my side. Uh, obviously, a lot of challenges in terms of like the public-private collaboration on the U.S. side. Um, but inherently, the maritime transportation uh, sector is very international uh, in the way that it operates and functions. Um, so we'd love to hear from folks uh, a little bit about um, how kind of collaboration and harmonization can look across the international spectrum and potentially like some challenges and opportunities in that space. Mm. Big question, not a two-minute question. Yeah. So. <laughs> So unfortunately, the biggest thing I see there is challenge. I really like to be a glass half full kind of guy, but in this in this particular case, I'm uh, I'm I mean thirsty, <laughs> and uh, there's not a lot there because the reality is we are in international competition, not just with adversaries and competitors, but with with our own allies uh, in a free market to who can do it cheaper, and 
you know, more security does not equal cheaper. That, that equation generally doesn't balance. Um, so the more we, we increase regulation, um, we have to be mindful in terms of U.S. federal regulation that it has to apply on every ship that calls on the United States, not just U.S. shipping, or we're going to hurt ourselves. And, and uh, you know, the, the U.S. Merchant Marine is already at a kind of historic low point of capacity. Uh, we need to be mindful while we try to increase security that we don't make that worse. Just from a, a sort of a guns and bombs perspective, um, the the pace and the, the kinds of technologies and the pace at which we purchase them and the kinds of things we're trying to do um, means we're outrunning most of our partners and allies in the process. And so the, yeah, it doesn't look, doesn't, doesn't look good. It's not looking good for harmonization um, in part because of the way in which, uh, at least from the military perspective, the way in which the United States uh, thinks about technology and its role in conflict. And so it's always the biggest, the, the faster, the, the further shooting, which means we're outrunning all of our allies who can barely afford those kinds of things. And so, yeah, harmonization is, uh, I think, from a, from, a, from a military perspective, I think is, is quite far off. Sorry, I say something now. I know we're at time. Yeah, wait a minute on a high note, pal. So, <laughs> so with that, I want, to, I want to, I want to ask the audience to be very kind to sort of give my, my colleagues a round of applause. Thank you. Um, the best part about this is that we all leave through the same door, and so please pull us aside and ask more specific questions if you'd like to. We're very excited to engage. Thank you.